Welcome to another episode of the Video Creator Show. Today, I am speaking with Ariel. He is the creator of Vortex Radar. He has built an entire YouTube channel around devices that you put in your car to keep yourself safe. They help you with uh, liability, you know, anything from dash cams to radar detectors, things like that. Now, this is a, a really interesting niche of YouTube. He's built his channel to well over 100,000 subscribers, uh, over 50, or sorry, 30 million channel views and he is doing he's doing well for himself he has a website uh where he recommends best radar detectors uh in just generally technology that i think there's a lot of interest in but it's hard to find the niche hey there you probably know the video creator show is brought to you by vidchops.com what is vidchops.com well it is an editing service that will take the horrible burden of editing off your back. We all know editing, video editing, it's tedious. It takes forever. But what if you had a professional who did it for you? You go to sleep, you wake up, it's done. Wouldn't that be magical? Vidchops.com. Hire a professional, save yourself time and energy, and take your YouTube channel to the next level. Ariel, I'm I'm very curious. How did you get into all of this? This does seem like quite the niche. Was it Russian dash cam videos? Is that what inspired you for all this? <laughs> it was actually what you said of how there's not a ton of good information online. And when I first got started with this, I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for good resources. But the only things that I could find were either maybe people on forums or uh, people making, this was kind of like 2012, 2011, there weren't a ton of YouTube videos. So it was like not a ton of videos out there. And it was either people who didn't know what they're talking about or somebody who was just doing Amazon affiliate links and just recommending stuff that they could make money off of, but wasn't necessarily something that was the best for me. And so I wound up buying something and I'm like, hey, cool. But that wasn't what was best for me. I actually wished I could have gotten something else that was a good fit for me. Um, and it's like, all right, fine, I'll go buy something else. And I'm going to test this one too, and kind of get a sense of the differences. And I just started realizing that testing stuff was a lot of fun and just the whole learning process was really enjoyable. So I'm like, let's just test something else and test something else and test something else because, well, again, I wanted to know the information. It wasn't out there. So I figured I'll, I'm just curious, you know, naturally I wanted to learn. So I just started testing and that's kind of how everything started from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It, I feel like a lot of YouTube channels, they start from just kind of a genuine interest of, you know, you you are interested in, in this case, some devices. Uh, you feel like there's not a lot of good information out there. You end up buying the devices, testing them yourself, and then you're like, eh, I'll post some things. And then one thing leads to another, and you have 100,000 subscribers. I always I always think that's beautiful. It's it's an organic way to grow a channel, um, and it, it seems like it's really built a passion for you like do you feel like your interest in these devices has kind of grown alongside your youtube channel like do you think you would be as well versed with these devices if you weren't talking about them on youtube i do think that there's something to say, be said about how much you learn when you take the time to share it with others like that saying of the teacher learns more than the student it is amazing how much you learn in the testing process and reviewing and discussing things with other people in the comments you get on YouTube, the discussions on social media and forums. Like you spend a lot of time discussing things and then discussing with the manufacturers and the engineers who design the product and the marketing people and people online who need tech support. Like you just, when you spend a ton of time devoted to this and like this is what your life is focused on, you just naturally learn a ton. I don't know if I would have learned as much if I wasn't focused on testing in YouTube because it just makes me focus on this so much more than I probably would otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, like there there is a teaching aspect of YouTube, isn't there? And I, I think a lot of people don't think of it like that. I suppose in your sphere, it is you are sharing information. There is a teaching aspect. It's kind of less entertainment focused and more informational focused. Like, w would you say that's fair? Yeah, like ultimately, I just want people to understand their tools, to know their capabilities, their limitations, how to use them properly, how to configure them. Like I want the tool to kind of be an extension of you so that when you're out driving, you know, your radar detector's got your back, your dash cam is recording, you know, you understand your tools. And I guess kind of like a musician, when you get really good at playing your instrument, you're not focused on like the fingerings and the notes and the embouchure and stuff. You're just, you're playing mm -hmm. and it is a tool to let you create something, experience something. So that's the focus is just I want people to have that experience mm -hmm. and I mean I feel like the student I'm not 
trying to teach people necessarily. Like I'm spending a ton of time learning and just here's something cool I tested and I found out and I just want to share that with you. So I never feel like I know enough. I've learned everything. I never actually feel super confident in a lot of this stuff. Like I feel like the perpetual student who there's always more to learn. There's more stuff to discover. And what if something I know now turns out to be incorrect? So like, let's test it. Let's discuss things with other people. Let's try to learn as much as I can and then just share the best information, the best quality information that I have. Like That's the point of this. Mm -hmm. So you're clearly doing well in this niche. And I'm curious about kind of the, the business aspect of all of this. You have a website where you have like recommendations for radar detectors and dash cams and kind of things like that. And then you have your YouTube channel where there's kind of ad revenue. But can you talk about like how you've turned this into, uh, at, at the very least, a side business, uh, if not more than that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I do this full time now. Uh, it didn't start off that way and I didn't create this for it to become a business. It was literally just, I'm testing stuff. And then people would say, Hey, you know, I watched your video testing this. It sounds like a great fit for me. I went out and bought it as a result of your test. I was like, Oh, I mean, I guess if you're going to go buy it, here's an affiliate link to Amazon mm -hmm. so I can make a percentage. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. You're going to buy it anyway. I, cool. I guess I can make something off it. That's cool. Um, and then it just kind of started to grow from there. Um, so at this point, as far as income streams, uh, affiliate links are definitely a big one. Uh, YouTube ads are also nice as well, but it's definitely a smaller portion of what I do. Um, and then there's also things like private sessions if people want one-on-one -on -one discussions, you know, instead of watching tons of videos and reading articles, it's just like, hey, you know, here's what I'm looking for, here's what I got, here's where I drive, what do I need? So mm -hmm. like private discussion type stuff. I did do Patreon for a little while. Um, I eventually decided to stop that just because like I've already got so much going on. It, I felt like I was letting people down if I'm not spending the extra time giving them all the behind the scenes stuff. And I'm like, Hey, I'm already focused so much on the main stuff. And so I wound up actually saying thanks, but like, I don't feel comfortable taking money if I'm not going to give you extra stuff. And so I decided to like stop the Patreon thing. So, um, at this point, yeah, affiliate stuff, a little bit of merch, but mostly affiliate stuff, some ads, uh, on YouTube, the automatic stuff, and then a little bit as far as like private sessions. Mm -hmm. And what is your background in? Like, what were you up to before all of this started taking off? Because I, I always find that's fascinating to find out. Like, who a, a lot of people might think, you know, oh, well, I have to be like this in order to start a YouTube channel. I have to have a background in that. But I'm curious, like, what were you up to before all of this? A bunch of random stuff. Like, uh, I mean, I always knew I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. I never knew what that would be, but I was like, hey, that's cool, you know, to have the freedom to be your own boss, do what you love, you know, all that kind of stuff. I knew I wanted to do that. Um, Education-wise, background is in electrical and computer engineering. That's what I did in school. I always grew up being like the tech guy, you know, teaching people about their computers and modems and AOL.com and all the stuff back then, you know, how to set up your printer. Um, so I was always like the tech mm -hmm. guy. Um, but after I went to school, uh, I got kind of burned out of just like sitting in a lab, you know, and just like building computer parts and designing circuitry. And I'm like, that's not what I want to do. I want to go out and just see the world and experience stuff. And I wound up spending a year just road tripping around the country and just mm. loved it, you know, camping, backpacking, going to see stuff, go wherever you want, as long as you want, and just really enjoyed seeing the world and traveling. Um, I did wind up getting a speeding ticket in Arizona, I think, <laughs> uh -huh. pulling off the highway. And I was like, man, I mean, I just, I'd spent so much time on the highway, I didn't slow down enough, and I didn't see what the speed limit was. I was just used to driving a little bit faster, so I got pulled over. I don't even remember what the speed is. Nothing crazy, but just, I was like, man, I wish I had a little bit more peace of mind, knowing what's going on around me, you know? And then uh, after that, I mean, I just, like, did photography professionally for a little while. I was super into, like, cameras and lenses and sensors and all the technical stuff. I shot Canon for many years. Now I shoot Sony. Um, sold cars for a little while. And I like the part of like, hey, I just want to teach people stuff about your navigation and Bluetooth, how to pair it with your car and how to use like the tech in your car. I don't necessarily want to sell you stuff, but I'm happy to help you find something that you enjoy, that you like, that really serves you, you know, but I don't want to feel like I'm having to sell you things mm -hmm. to make a living. And so like, even though I do some of that now, I'm like, hey, you know, if you want to buy something, here's a detector, here's a dash cam. Like, that's not my focus. That's not why I'm here. It's a way to support my love of just learning and sharing. Um, but now it's like, I don't really care what people buy. It's just go buy whatever you want. Like maybe I'll make money. Maybe I won't, but like, I just love 
being able to share the information with people and then do with it what you will. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm curious about that year where you were traveling around the U.S. Like, what do you like? Where did you go exactly? And what do you more importantly, like, what did you get out of it? Do you feel like do you think it gave you a totally new perspective on things? Do you feel like it kind of set you up for uh, the chapter of your life after that? Um, yeah, I, I'm curious kind of how it helped you or even ways maybe where it didn't help you. Yeah, I mean, it was just, I loved being able to do something that I really enjoyed. And I was like, I mean, in some ways I would make money. I was like, okay, well, I had this photo shoot in Texas. And so instead of uh, flying me out there, the company that was going to fly me out to go shoot, it was like a cheerleading competition. Uh, I was going to go shoot that. And I was like, well, instead of covering my flight, my airfare, why don't you cover my gas as I drive out there? And so they did. And so I drove out to Texas. They reimbursed my expenses. And I was like, well, that's cool. You know, I can actually find a way to get paid doing something that I love. Or I was down in Florida and I shot a photo of a lighthouse and posted on like a stock photo site and it wound up getting sold and used on like a magazine cover. And I was like, well, that's cool. I'm finding ways of actually making money doing something that I love that's not necessarily a traditional job that's maybe less stable and predictable than going to work and getting a salary, but it gives me a lot more flexibility and options that I didn't know of. And it was just kind of cool to be ex able to experience new things and yeah, just literally make money doing something that you love of something that's not necessarily predictable, but still possible. And I really like that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does seem like a good precursor to YouTube or like something that would uh, get get the, the juices flowing, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. I do find that's really important. Um, I, I feel like being burned out with work it can really limit what you end up doing. Like your potential, I feel like a lot of it has to do with how you feel on the inside. You know, if you're tired and exhausted and bored um, and just kind of dreading the day to day, uh, it's going to be hard to really thrive. Um, like it's sometimes you do kind of have to shock your system like that. And it, it sounds like that's kind of what that was. It changed your perspective a lot. Um, you were able to enjoy life and find, uh, as you said, new ways to make money, which is huge. Um, enjoying uh, how you make a living, I think, contributes to a lot of like true happiness. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if YouTube is necessarily the answer for everybody, and it's not like this is the solution to the dread of going to work. Like, that, this has its issues, too, and there's still stress and obligations, yeah, and I got two little kids at home, so, like, lack of sleep is a thing, and I drink buckets of coffee, and that's still not enough to keep me energized <laughs> and, like, ready to shoot and edit and everything, and, like... I, YouTube is awesome, for sure. I love it, being able to do your own thing, but it's not kind of like the end-all, be-all solution to the quote-unquote traditional job. Like, it's got its pros and cons like anything else. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I, I'm curious, you said this is your full-time job, and mm -hmm. you post, you know, you, you post somewhat sporadically sometimes, but, like, yeah. what is your kind of schedule, and what does your day-to-day -day workflow look like? Yeah. I, one thing I've been really wanting is to get more videos up, but the way that I do my testing, it's so like extensive for the testing itself, the discussion with manufacturers, discussion with forums, the, the shooting, the I go out and shoot the B-roll and then I learn something else and I got to reshoot a section of the A-roll and cover it up with new B-roll. So like the testing itself is very laborious. Mm. I mean, I, I like it, but like I've been trying to outsource that part so that I can get more just more stuff done. I've been spending about two years trying to look for like a good video editor and that's, I haven't found a single one yet. That's like a good fit for what I'm looking for. And, um, so yeah, what I do now, I mean, as far as the process itself to make a video, like after I wake up in the morning, um, do all the stuff in the morning with breakfast, drop off kids at daycare, walk the dog dishes, just stuff you do at home. It's like, all right, so where did I leave off as far as videos? Am I, let's say I've got a new project I want to shoot. Maybe I just finished up a dash cam review right now. That video, two weeks, which is pretty quick for me, just focused on this dash cam video. So everything as far as just like testing it out, bringing home, you know, video samples, looking at the quality, comparing it to several other dash cams that I have on the windshield to try to figure out how this one handles this situation better than that one. Um, just start writing, writing down notes on my phone, which syncs up with my computer. And I'm like, okay, now I want to go and test out the parking mode stuff. So I'll go run out to the car and I'll grab some cameras and stuff and start doing some parking mode testing to see what that's like. Cool 
come bring all the stuff back home, pop it on the computer, watch the videos, start adding it to my notes. And it's the same thing if you want to learn about the cloud integration, uh, spending time on discussion forums to see what are the common issues that people are having. Is there something that I should be aware of that maybe isn't applicable to my situation, but a lot of other people would experience it. So it's not just my own mm -hmm. review, but like I'm trying to get as much data as I can. So it's just like a lot of testing different aspects of any product. Test daytime, nighttime. You want to do nighttime testing? Okay. When do you do it? Do you wake up super early before the kids are up or do you do it when you're tired at the end of the day mm -hmm. after the kids have already gone to bed to go do your nighttime recording and hope you remember to clean the windshield, all the dash cams are plugged in, the settings are correct, uh, all that stuff. You're hoping everything is right so that you can bring everything back and then pull all the dash cam footage, find good times of where everything is synced up. And it's just like every little step to make the video and get the information is pretty time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, it's like, yeah, I mean, these videos, one dash cam review itself is like two to three weeks. Hmm. Wow. And then when you start getting several requests per week or several requests per day for companies saying, Hey, can you test and review my dash cam? Can you, I'm like, nah, man, where do I get the time for that? Like, I'm just going to test the ones that I'm interested in that I think are pretty cool that have something unique and novel that are not just another box that sits on your windshield and records while you drive. Like, that's great. That's the classic bread and butter stuff. But like, as a reviewer, I wanted to find something interesting that kind of like creatively that's cool or just some new feature or something, you know? So it's, same thing for radar detectors. That's a lot of testing as well. Setting up multiple radar guns in different situations and multiple cameras and other people doing their own tests and compiling all the information. It's like just getting the information to share with people is probably one of the most time consuming things. It's not like something that I test for a day or two and I'm like, well, I know everything about it. Let me just sit down in front of the camera for 10 minutes and tell you about it. Like it's, it's a very time consuming process to actually create the video and then to sit down and edit it and put all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Right. And is that why at least partially you're struggling to have a video editor? Like what? So I, I'm curious when you have all the information, let's say you have collected all the data and in info about a dash cam and you kind of, do you write a script and then kind of say it into the microphone and then take all of your footage and then put it over your, your recording or um, like, what is, what does that look like? And why do you think it's been hard for you to find the right editor? Yeah. So it's a combination of finding somebody who's very detail oriented, um, who like editing style is a good fit for who understands what I'm trying to get across. Uh, and then also how much prep it takes for me to actually give them what they need. So let's say I, I've got my outline of points that I want to make. And I'll, when I'm sitting in front of the camera, I usually have my laptop in front of me with the different points. And so I'm like, okay, I want to talk next about this. And here's the main points I want to reference. And then I just talk. And if it's cool, good. If not, I'll just do another take. Um, so I kind of have like my initial A roll that I shoot. And then as far as B roll from the outline, I'm like, okay, well, I know that I need, you know, clips to demonstrate this, this, and this. Um, and then I need to go back and find a lot of these clips. So I've got like on my NAS, I've got archives of, you know, just terabytes of videos from different radar detectors and dash cam mm -hmm. stuff. A lot of that stuff, I have to go and find a specific clip and then I'll label the video file. And I'm like, okay, this is this product. I want you to use this part of the video to demonstrate this specific feature. And then in my notes, I'm usually like sending over the information of reference this file. Hopefully they can figure that out. If somebody's not very familiar with the nuances of the product, they may not know like what they're looking at and what it should reference. Um, and so it's a very time consuming process to give people the information that they need when I can just go grab the video file and slap it onto the timeline myself. Yeah. Um, the dash cam stuff, because of the way that I'm, you know, let's say I've got three or four dash cams I'm testing at the same time. I'm laying all the clips on the timeline already and doing the freeze frames and the license plate zoom ins and stuff. And so by the time I'm ready to shoot the A roll, I actually have a lot of the B roll already prepared. And so does it really save me time to have an editor redo all the work that I've already mm -hmm. been doing? Right. Not necessarily, but maybe I can send out like the easy stuff. that's just me sitting in front of a camera and doesn't require a ton of knowledge about the product. Mm -hmm. There's, there's also concerns of like, if I've got a dash cam in my car, do they understand privacy wise, which part of the clips to use? So they're not showing, you know, certain things maybe at my house or mm -hmm. my family that if I don't necessarily want that publicly available or, uh, the cameras are running with audio. And do I want to be sending somebody on the internet, you know, 
private conversations in my car that I've got with my wife or my kids. And mm. so if I do that, maybe I'm uh, losslessly cutting the audio out of the dash cam clips before I send that over. So there's just a lot of like extra step and prep uh, that I need to be able to send things over so they know what to do and how to actually edit the video. And so being able to send all of that stuff over and then multiple revisions and drafts of like they send me something and then I'm like, okay, this is good. Change that, change this, change that. It's just sometimes it's easier just to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so like it's just been tough to for me figure out the process of how I can get all this information out and then also find somebody who can do a good job of like, can I just send you stuff without having to explain every little thing? So I can just send you the A roll and the B roll and you figure it out. Like that would be awesome. Um, but I understand it can be difficult for somebody to know like what part of a specific clip to use for the video if you're not already like super familiar with what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that sounds like a very very specific person that you need. Um, I'm sure yes. there's like at least one person floating out there in the world. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah, I I see the the difficulty there. Like, do you? Mm -hmm. So do you want to scale up? Are you currently happy with kind of where you are with the channel? Or have you thought like maybe I could create another channel that is somehow tangential or related to this where maybe it would be easier to hire an editor um, because mm -hmm. the content is different? Like ha have you thought about that? So scaling up or creating a second channel with something somewhat similar? I thought about that when my uh, first kid was born when our daughter was born I was like awesome let me go do a video testing baby products and strollers mm. and audio monitors and you know like baby monitors and stuff and so I started up a channel it was gonna be called vortex daddy I didn't <laughs> I didn't realize how exhausted you are when you've got a newborn at home and how time-consuming it is and I mean just how you're constantly waking up through the night like you're not getting sleep and I, I, I posted zero videos like yeah, it, that mm. never took off. Um, and even now, like, I'm finally getting to the point now our daughter's three and a half, almost four. Our son is about one and a half now, and he's starting to sleep through the night. So, like, my wife and I are finally at the point where we're starting to be able to go back to the gym mm. and, like, exercise, which has been great for, like, emotionally and physically. It's just been good just to get that, you know? Um, so now the kids are sleeping better. We're able to do that. And so my biggest issue at this point is there's so much stuff I want to test and review and my list is huge of stuff that I want to cover, but like everything that I want to do takes a ton of time. And so I'm trying to figure out how can I get through more stuff? Do I do just like quicker stuff? Do I go into less details in the videos? Can I outsource the editing? That would be awesome. I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, do I maybe answer questions less in the YouTube comments so I get my time back? Mm -hmm. It's uh, a lot of discussion on like, how can I just speed up this process to get more stuff done, to get make it easier for myself? Um, I don't really know how to do that. I've been trying, but it's definitely been a struggle for a while now. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, I see the conundrum there, and I I feel like for now you you seem pretty content with where you're at, and that's always a good place to to be. Is that safe to say? Like, are you content, or is there a part of you that's like, I wanna I wanna also do something new? I would just, I want to be able to get more stuff done. I never feel like there's enough time in a day. I never have enough energy and my list keeps growing and I have to keep not doing stuff that I really want to do or people are asking for. So my thing right now is just, I want to do more and I'm not sure how to make that happen. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, I'm content with like the subject matter. I don't think it would necessarily make sense to start a second channel. Maybe I could do a second channel that's just like random clips of like a radar detector save or just something funny that happened on a dash cam or maybe something like that. Maybe some behind the scenes stuff, but like I haven't even posted a single short yet. Like I'd love mm. to get into shorts. Mm -hmm. I know YouTube is really pushing that yes. yet. I haven't even gotten into shorts yet. So I know that's a big thing to really do as well. Uh, there's just a ton of stuff that I would love to do. I mean, things are going fine now. I'm content in that way, but like there's still so much stuff that I would love to do in many ways. So content and not content. Mm -hmm. I'm like, eager for more sure yeah and, and now now that you are like deep into the full-time youtube life like how how do you feel it compares to your career beforehand it's definitely what i wanted and then it gives me the flexibility if i want to go on vacation with my family if i want to sleep if my well, realistically at this point my kids get sick and so they can't go to daycare and so like my wife and i we have to take care of them and so we'll just like tag team back and forth or sometimes my mom helps or like I've got more flexibility with when I start and stop or 
kid gets hurt, I have to go run and pick him up from school. Like I can do that as needed, you know? Um, so having that flexibility to start and stop and do what I want and go on vacation and all of that, I love that aspect of it. Um, I also feel like financially this offers a lot of possibilities and room for growth that I would otherwise be capped in if I did like a traditional engineering job. Mm. Um, I don't necessarily get a lot of the benefits of like life insurance provided or health insurance provided by the company. Luckily, my wife has a more traditional job, so I got that, you know, but like I don't have a lot of the benefits of like, oh, getting paid in stock options and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's literally just YouTube. But the growth potential, I think, is a lot higher than like most traditional jobs, even well-paying like tech jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one exciting part of it. And like, do you... So the ceiling is higher, of course. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of room for growth. Um, how how do you feel about maybe when you post a video and it doesn't do as well as you would like? Like, is that something that kind of makes you nervous or because you have these affiliate links that clearly do very well for the channel and you're not building a channel based off ad revenue, it's more kind of selling products through affiliate links. Do you feel like your income is stable enough to where you don't really worry about that? Yeah, I mean, it's sufficiently stable. It's not like my majority of my income comes from whatever the last video is that I posted. Like, there's still stuff. If you, what's the best radar detector or whatever, you can watch those videos from three months ago or from six months ago, and like people are going to keep watching it. It's not like I have to have another video now. Um, I like to keep the ball rolling as far as ad revenue and just keeping up with new stuff that's coming out. You know, it's, it's just fun to create and to share. Um, but I'm not really concerned with like, oh, a video didn't do well. Whatever. Some do better than others. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure if I was more into like analytics and SEO and marketing and like the YouTuber face with the crazy thumbnails, <gasps> you know, like all the clickbaity stuff, like that's not my thing. You know, I'm just like, I just test stuff that I'm interested in. I share it with you. Maybe you watch it. Maybe you don't. I don't it, it's just fun to learn and to share, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not as concerned about like the success of any video. Don't get me wrong. I love it. It's cool seeing the view counts and it's seeing stuff sometimes that like takes off that I wasn't expecting that happens. But for me, the fun is just the learning and the sharing, not so much the results of that. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm like, hey, make enough money, I can do my thing. Love to save more, love to invest more, love to have more. Who wouldn't? But like, as long as I'm doing it right, okay, it's cool. Let's just keep going. Mm -hmm. That is a very pure mindset. I, I respect it. I uh, like you have kind of had the same style of thumbnail for years now, from what I can tell. You know, sometimes you have your face, but overall, it seems like you just, you know, you show a picture of the camera or the cameras um, or whatever the device is. And overall, that seems to be um, kind of your style. And it's all about the information. It's about the testing and the, the details. And I, I, you know, I respect that. Like you kind of you haven't tried to not like sell out, but you haven't tried to appeal to the lowest common denominator, which I think can be very appealing. And I've seen it like it can end up even destroying channels. So um, I, I feel like this is a big reason why you've stood the test of time. I mean, you started the channel seven years ago. Is that? Um... I think I originally started the channel in like 2011, 2012, something like that. It was just a place to post dash cam Samples. I'm testing two different dash cams. Here's a clip from this one and from that mm -hmm. one and posting on forums. So it was just a place to share stuff. Um, I don't, I have no idea when it started as a business or income producing. It was just, but I think I started the channel in 2012. Mm -hmm. sure. Something like that. Sure. And how long did it take before you felt like this could be a real business? No idea. A couple years, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just one of those things where like I started realizing, oh, I can make money at this. And it started to grow, and I'm like, wait, at some point, this could actually take over for my job? Mm -hmm. Oh, I could actually do this full-time? That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, around when my dad passed away in 2013 or so, I remember I wanted to just quit car stuff because I wasn't really enjoying like the car sales thing, and I started focusing more on YouTube. Um, I think I was doing other stuff. I don't even remember, but... Maybe around then, 2013, 2014 was when I started pushing it harder and like really diving into it. Um, and it became kind of like a natural transition from like, all right, I don't want to do that anymore, but I have this other thing. Let's put more time and energy into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It, it feels very organic. And organic, I feel like, is always the, the key to YouTube success. Uh, if you try to force things too much, then um, bad things can happen for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of people I see that are like super business oriented. 
um, who are like, hey, let's create new channels. Let's do all this stuff with sponsorships. And I was watching a video the other day of like people creating channels using AI and how all that stuff <laughs> yes, works. Yes. And just, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. And I love seeing the different approaches. But just, I mean, this is who I am. This is just my personality, my style. So I do my thing. You do you. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Tons of options, whatever works. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about how you might be able to use AI with your channel? I know that's like kind of, I'm sure you've thought about it. I feel like everybody has thought about it. Um, I've certainly tried it. And, uh, you know, like for me, it has limited uses of like, if I have writer's block, you know, uh, write me a paragraph about this and it'll write something. And even if I use like two sentences, um, it's still kind of got me going. But is AI mm -hmm. something that you've thought about um, that maybe you'd want to do or utilize either for this channel or for kind of a future channel? Yeah, it's the same thing. I've been wondering too. I'm like, this is obviously amazing. And holy cow, what's going on with this new tech and how do we use it? Mm -hmm. um, I've been playing with it recently, chat GPT-4 to like, all right, I want to come up with a YouTube title or a two sentence description that gives a little bit more information. And so I would just tell it, you know, like, hey, I want to get this point across. Here's the information. Can you make me a nice just intro for it? So I'll do that like for the video description. I've been experimenting with that. Um, I haven't been using it for... Uh, scripting necessarily for the outlines or for the editing. I actually am really curious to use some of it as like stock photos. Hmm. So I'm like, hey, I want a nice stock photo of this. Can you generate something that shows like a car driving in the sunset or I don't know, whatever. Just like cool visuals that would illustrate something. So if I don't necessarily have like, I want to show something with a radar detector and you're driving down a nice long, straight, flat road. I'm like, well, the last time I was down on a road like that, cross country in 2014 or whatever. And so like I have my archives of videos, but maybe that's with like an older camera. The resolution wasn't super mm -hmm. great. I want something newer and nicer. So maybe I can use AI to help me generate some of that stuff. Um, that could be something that I'd be interested in as opposed to using like a stock photo or stock video or something. So that I think could be pretty cool too. But I think a lot of this is just like, what is this thing and how can we use it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I, I have kind of racked my brain with how to use AI. And you, like you, you see all these videos of like, you know, AI to make you millions of dollars. And the thumbnail is like a guy falling asleep in his bank account getting filled with money or something. Um, it's always like <laughs> preposterous things. And I think there, to a certain extent, there's a grift here. And obviously to a certain extent, there's a real revolution happening. Um, but it, it isn't necessarily always obvious how to use this kind of disruptive technology for um, whatever it is you're doing. Um, I think uh, I've, like I said, I've kind of struggled with this as well. Um, at some point, hopefully, I feel like AI video editors are like maybe five years away, 10 years away from being truly useful. Um, mm -hmm. That seems like something that could be appealing, you know, with all of your terabytes of footage, like, hey, show, you, if you could like type in a line that was like, uh, get me the footage when the, the camera is reading these numbers or I don't know, something like that um, could save you a lot of time potentially. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I try to label every single video file in my archive so I can just search for, you know, this detector or this feature and it's doing that or whatever. So it shows up and I can pull the file, but to have AI, it's like, what if there's something else interesting in that video clip that I didn't know about it and think of and it can pull it. Like that could be really cool. Mm -hmm. For sure. And what advice would you give to somebody who is just starting out in YouTube or they haven't really gotten their feet under them? Maybe they're frustrated. Maybe they lack confidence. Um, they just, they haven't really gotten over the, the hump yet. Yeah, I, I guess if you put a lot of pressure to like, this has to be the thing, if you want to get famous or you want to make a ton of money or whatever your motivating thing is, if you want some end result, it, yeah, it sounds like it would be a lot of pressure. I mean, that was never what it was for me. It was literally just, I love sharing. I love learning. And this is a cool avenue where instead of something I'm discussing, something one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I could just make a video and share it with like thousands of people at the time. That sounds like a really useful and efficient use of my time. So if it can be something that it sounds like you would enjoy, that would be beneficial and you love the process of creating and sharing itself, even if nobody watches the video, if you're enjoying it, I think long-term it's gonna be a lot more successful than if you're trying to chase some result of certain subscriber count or income or fame, I don't know, whatever the like, external goal is. If you, if you just love the creative process, I think that's gonna be long-term 
mm -hmm. a much better approach. Mm -hmm. Sure. And can you talk about how your website kind of works with your channel? Like, what exactly do you use it for? Like, how important is it to your business model? Because um, I, I think a website is something that, like, I, I've had popular YouTube channels, I still do, but I've never kind of figured out how to utilize a website with them. Like, do you recommend that? Do you think it is just useful for what you do? Um, yeah, let, let's kind of get some more details on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to speak about my use case. I don't know if it's going to apply to like every channel and every style, of course. But for myself, I found it to be really useful for a couple reasons. One, not everybody wants to watch a video. Right? If you want to watch a 20 or 30 minute long video, maybe you just want to like skim over an article in your phone or something. You want to just, you know, jump to whatever you want. You'd rather read, you know, maybe you can't listen to audio right now. You'd rather read something. So I find the companion articles, it can cover a lot of the same stuff that would be in a video. Some people prefer the, the written format. Other people want the video one because they want to like see the thing in action. They want radar detector. You want to see it functioning. You want dash cam, you want to see the video quality of what it's like, you know, you want to hear the audio that it records or what the thing sounds like. Mm -hmm. So I think there's times, sometimes the written version is better. There's times when the uh, video is better. I personally prefer the videos just because I, I like making videos. That's fun for me. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of times the written stuff works better. So in terms of like conversion rate and effectiveness business wise, sometimes I'll make more money from like a written article that takes a fraction of the time in the video, no editing. It's just like, I already have my notes for what I want to say in a video. I'll just kind of like repurpose my notes and add some photos and screenshots and whatever. And boom, there's an article done. Yay. But no A roll to shoot, no B roll, no editing, nothing. Like it's so much faster. And oftentimes I'll, in terms of like affiliate sales, I'll make more from the written stuff than I will from the video. And so in terms of like loaf hanging fruit, the written stuff is oftentimes much better bang for the, uh, the buck than the video. I think the video helps to build a lot of credibility, you know, I think as far as like, oh, okay, I, I know this guy, I trust what he has to say, I've seen him, uh, I'll read his written stuff. The written ones are also really nice, like a buyer's guide type thing, that's really easy to update. If there's a new detector that comes out or we discover an issue with the detector, I can update a written article really easily. A video, if it's already published, I can't go back and edit a video. I would have to reshoot the entire thing or release like an update video that says, hey, we discovered this issue or here's a new detector and there's new whatever's that come out. So I have to reshoot the whole thing. A written article, I can just go and edit a WordPress page. Like it's not a big deal. So both of them are very effective for different reasons. And some people like the written stuff. Some people like the video, but I find them, at least for what I do, to be very useful. Uh, sometimes I'll maybe do a video and then I'll have like an article that might go into even more information and more detail if I don't want to go into it in the article or in the video. Or if it's something like, hey, you know, I'm going to do a video that teaches you how to use this radar detector that explains all the settings. Once you're familiar with the settings, you just want a recommendation on what settings to punch in your detector. Head on over to the written article hmm. and that will give you all my recommended settings at the bottom. Hmm. Or if there's a new firmware update that comes out. Right, and it adds some features or it changes the functionality of a feature. I, I can't reshoot the tutorial video. I don't necessarily want to do the entire video all over just because like one or two features changed. But I'll just be like, all right, I'll go update this article. And at the top, there will be a note that this article is current as of this date, this firmware version, and I've made any changes. So like the video will progressively go more and more out of date over time. Uh, the articles I can keep up to date much more easily. Hmm. So. Hmm pros and cons to both. Sure. And is the main yeah. traffic source to the website from your YouTube channel? Uh, and do you also do kind of Google AdWords or keywords? Like how, how do you promote the website exactly? I, I don't really promote it. I don't do AdWords. I don't do paid search. My SEO is pretty minimal, probably pretty bad to be honest. I mean, that's not my focus. I probably should do more. Mm. Um, so I'm sure stuff could rank better. I do find it kind of weird sometimes when like I'll Google for best radar detector and the top ones are just like random Amazon affiliate links from people who may or may not know what they're talking about, but they're really good at the marketing, the SEO stuff. That's not my forte. Um, I should probably have somebody help me with that. I don't want to get necessarily too clickbaity with the titles and like I, I don't really know that stuff as much. Um, so I don't spend a ton of time on that. I probably should. I'm sure that's a weakness of mine and something I could definitely improve on. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, it, it goes to show you also, if you're able to build an audience with videos, then you don't necessarily have to be an expert in every kind of field of online marketing. Uh, YouTube is such a good place to build a dedicated audience or for new people to find you. And once you kind of have that audience and you're able to uh, maintain that, then uh, a website like yours or affiliate links, like it becomes a really reliable source of revenue. And I mean, clearly that's been the, the case for you. Um, have you ever felt like your channel was, um, I don't know, like you were going through a phase where it felt like the videos weren't doing as well? And I know you said you don't worry too much about like how a new video is doing because uh, of the way that your kind of business is, is built. But have you ever felt like your channel went through a slump? And if so, like how were you able to get out of it? Yeah, for me, the biggest slumps are not necessarily the success of the videos, but my own, like, enthusiasm mm -hmm. and emotional state. So I find that, like, I go through phases of burnout, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, lately it's just been lack of sleep and kids and exhaustion and not enough time and, like, all that kind of stuff. But in the past, it's been... I love talking to people and helping people. And if I spend time responding to every single YouTube comment, I still read every single one or every Facebook post or whatever. Just like, I don't have time left to respond to every person personally and, you know, be tech support for everybody in the internet. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not here. I'm not customer service. That's not my thing. That's not really even what I enjoy. I, I really want people to have a good experience. I don't want them to feel like, Hey, I recommended this thing. And then you bought it based on my recommendation and you got it. And now you're having all these issues. And I'm like, thanks for the money. I'm out of here. Like I, I really want to help people, you know, but I keep finding that if I spend a ton of time being personal, tech support for everybody, like I get burned out on that. And so now, for example, one of the solutions I found is like, I really want you to have the solution. So instead of asking me, can you post it on a forum instead or ask in a public area um, so that like we can all see what the issues are and you can get help from myself or from somebody else who also knows this and we can start to see if it's a recurring issue. And then if somebody else has the same problem, I'm like, okay, instead of me answering the same question over and over, head on over here. Somebody else has had the same question and here's the solution that they found. So I'm really trying to find ways of not it's kind of like making videos instead of answering something once I can make a video and help a ton of people. And I'm trying to find a way to like make the tech support side mm. similar without me having to be the one do it. Like with radar detectors, it's kind of a niche thing. It's like, if your car breaks, you can go to a car mechanic. There's every car, city has tons of them. Right. But right. if your detector has issues, who do you ask? Maybe the manufacturer, some of those guys are outsourced. Like they may or may not be able to help. Maybe you go into forums. Maybe you ask somebody like me, there's not a ton of resources to get help. And so like, Finding ways to help people get the help that they need without it having to be me trying to help everybody personally and then just burning me out in the process has been one of the things that I've really had to work on of like helping people without me doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been a recurring lesson. It's easy to get sucked into like somebody has a question, let's answer it real quick. But then when that gets to be like dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of questions, you're like, well, man, when do I get time to like test and shoot and edit and right. sleep and spend time with my family and just, yeah. So mm -hmm. it, figuring out that balance has been a big one. Sure. And how much do you feel like answering questions feeds into the success of your channel? Do you feel like it's kind of more of a charity thing? Or do you feel like by doing that, you have ended up building a dedicated audience, people who are more likely to use your affiliate links? Um, like how, how much of that do you think is really important? And how much of it do you feel like is like, I don't know, you just want to help this person and um, that you can't help yourself? I think a lot of it's the latter. I'm like, it's so easy when you see a YouTube comment pop up and you're like, somebody has a question. Okay, I can just tell you the answer. It'll take me 30 seconds to write something up real quick. Not a big deal. That's gonna, you get the answer without having to wait for a video that maybe I'll do in a month. Maybe I'll never get done just because of time constraints. And so it's so easy to just like respond to comments because I really want to help people and I want them to have the information. I get it. There's not a ton of good information. But again, it's not just one question, it becomes hundreds and then thousands. And so it's really easy for that to snowball and like, oh, I'll just help a little more and help a little bit more. And so, mm -hmm. yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. It's uh, just one thing leads to another, and there there's no like obvious line of when you've spent too much time or not enough time, uh, or or whatever. It's uh, I don't know. I I respect what you're doing there, and I do feel like having somebody there to answer specific questions. Um, I can see why that is maybe addicting is the wrong word, but I mean you're clearly helping people with questions that they can't really get answered anywhere else or they maybe they can but it's just really inconvenient um so yeah i i get it and kind of one of the one of the last things i wanted to talk to you about uh you live stream uh, a decent amount like can you talk about what live streaming has done for your channel like what a like how do you feel like it has helped you um your live streaming views are quite good um relative to your your channel size and yeah what what has it done for you? Um, how do you think that live streaming helps you in ways that normal videos cannot? That's a great question. Yeah, I really enjoy live streams and I think they're awesome as like a, another type of video. They're definitely different than like a full on review where I take the time to have all the A roll and B roll and stuff. Live streams is just like, man, let's just sit down and let's just chat. Let's hang out, mm -hmm. right? So we'll talk about whatever. Maybe I'll share for the first 10, 15 minutes, whatever I'm working on or what's on my mind, you know, and then we kind of get into a QA. and a And it becomes a really fun just discussion with people, especially when you work from home and you're not going to the office. You're not seeing people in real life as much. And it's a great way to get like that kind of socialization with other enthusiasts, people who are super passionate about it, who are going to hang out with you on a Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. and just like talk radar detectors for an hour. Like it's cool to just hang out with people who are really interested. Additionally, it's also been really nice because once the video is done, I just turn the video off and I'm done. Right. I walk away. There's no editing. There's no <laughs> none of that. Like I'm done. And so I can get a lot of content out very easily and it's just up online and it's ready to go and anybody can watch it at any point. And so sometimes it's just an easy way to like get content up quicker i can share my initial like feedback and thoughts and maybe response like oh something happened let's just talk about it real quick and then i can hear other people's perspectives and then we can just quickly like go back and forth and what do you think what do i think what have you seen with this driving around in that location maybe somewhere that i don't go what's your experience been and so it's like discussing things on a forum or like a written place but just much more fast-paced Mm -hmm. and interactive and so yeah it's just been fun to create extra content that takes zero editing once you're done shooting yeah god that's such a huge thing of i even like this podcast you know we have an editor of course but i'm so yep. used to um like when i shoot a video i have to edit it myself um kind of being able to start in that stop and then kind of your role is done is really i mean it's great um i just uh, and i still edit videos to this day but kind of for other things but it's man like knowing <laughs> that like you know okay you have a two hour live stream that's two hours there's nothing there's nothing else to do here like you <laughs> you've done it um and that is a huge appeal to to live streaming and you know for anybody who maybe is burn burned out uh with running a channel like i i do think live streaming is uh, another way where you can engage with your audience and it's um a different kind of work and it's maybe not as monotonous uh, at times like do you feel like you've been able to lean on live streaming when you are going through those periods uh of less motivation yeah it's actually been really helpful because it if i'm feeling like all right I want to be happy and upbeat, but if I'm feeling a little down, sometimes I hop on the live stream and I wind up getting more energy just from the discussions with people. Mm. And it, so that's been really helpful. It also feels good sometimes if you feel a little stuck to like, I can get more content out real quick. I just, boom, let's just hang out and live stream for an hour or two or 30 minutes, whatever it is, and like get more stuff out for people. That's really cool too. I've also seen some channels who are like really focused on the live streaming and they've got like multiple camera angles or they're showing TVs or their computer screen and they're able to just discuss stuff and it's like a really well built thing so they can switch angles on the fly and again it takes no editing once you're done so i've seen some people who like really do an awesome job with that i would love to get more into that sometimes i'm like okay maybe i'll switch camera angles with my computer and all that do a little picture in picture stuff so i've been playing with that but i don't think that the majority of my content is really conducive to a live stream i need to actually like show you pre-recorded stuff of you know radar detector in action or a dash cam at recording whatever as I'm driving down the road. Like I can't really do that while live streaming. So it's for me at least just kind of like another type of video that has its own benefits. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. And uh, so we're we're reaching the end of our hour here. But one of the last things I wanted to ask you is, you know, you you have social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Like, do you like what is your take on social media when y- YouTube is kind of your main bread and butter? Do you feel like it adds a lot? Um, do you feel like it's worth time? Do you feel like you should be putting more time into it or even less time? Like, wh- what is your take on how social media um can feed into a YouTube channel. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. I feel like I should put more time into that. But again, it's one of the things where I'm like, no, nah, just focus on the videos. So mm-hmm. I'll use it for stuff of like, hey, a company just announced a new product and I'll just share it on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. Um, and then we can have some initial discussion and feedback. And so it's a way for me to get content out quicker and, and kind of get the discussions going sooner. And then I'm able to use some of that stuff in a video. And I'm like, hey, you know, I just want to share this with you guys real quick. I'm going to work on a video. Take me a couple days. But, like, here you go. Information's already out there. Um, and it's also a nice place, to, I guess, like an extra place just to share the videos because not everybody's going to have, like, YouTube notifications turned on. Or maybe they don't check the YouTube app that often. Maybe they're just on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's just another outlet to let people know mm-hmm. that you've got a video, that you've got more content. And so I found it to be helpful for that, too. I don't engage as much in the discussions, on like Twitter, I mean, I'm probably a little bit more on Facebook with posting stuff and responding in some of the comments. Again, personality thing. Some people are more into Instagram. Probably should do better with Instagram, but that's just not me. So, you know, we all have our things. I just find it helpful for like early discussions, number one, and then also just sharing content that already exists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, sometimes a like something simple, you know, it lives on Twitter and it just is a better place than than YouTube. Um, obviously, YouTube kind of has its community tab, but I don't know. Sometimes it just makes more sense on on Twitter. And I, yep, that that all makes sense. I've kind of had a similar philosophy with social media in running my channels. Um, you know, they have they can have limited helpfulness uh it's another place i think to remind people that you have cool things to say um Mm -hmm. and that has kind of a um an indirect helpful um it it could be indirectly helpful um yeah yeah. i mean i guess it's also nice like with youtube you can keep making money off of content that you posted years ago you know with tech maybe it's a little harder because like there's new versions of stuff and whatever but if you have something that's like just basic educational on how a product works or just the laws of whatever whatever it is, something that's more evergreen, you can post a video and just like benefit from it for years down the line versus you post something on Twitter and it's gone soon. So it's just a different mindset. Like I want to build kind of an encyclopedia almost, like a huge reference of information so YouTube is a better platform than that. But again, everybody has different approaches and different styles. So I like it, if anything, it's just a way to promote the bigger content that's going to stay on YouTube. So. Mm-hmm. Right on. Well, Ariel, this has been great. His channel is Vortex Radar. His website is vortexradar.com. And uh, seriously, any kind of device for your car, radar detector, dash cam, kind of thing, things in that area, uh, he really is the one-stop shop for anything you would need to know. He, I mean, as you have heard, he goes into lots of detail. Uh, go check him out. And uh, it, it'll be great. You will learn a lot. And perhaps you will uh, save your yourself some some money uh in the long run you know somebody backs india uh you got it on film that would be pretty helpful wouldn't it that's the whole point is <laughs> keeping you protected in the road <laughs> yep indeed well hey whoever you are listening watching uh you are awesome and i will see you in the next one bye everybody